Welcome to the Young CPA Success Show. If you're a young accounting professional, this podcast is your ultimate guide to navigating your early career. Join us as we share valuable insights, expert advice, and practical tips to help you kickstart your path to success and excel in the accounting industry. Let's embark on this exciting accounting journey together. Jody, thanks for hopping on with us. We, we've been we've had this one circled for a while, and it's it's really funny because Hannah and I just got done recording a podcast with um, an accounting student, which was really kind of cool. He's coming on on this show in a couple of uh, in a couple of days. We're going to do a okay. a different thing there, but he asked some really interesting questions about Summit VCFO by Anders and what it is we're doing. And this is where I really wanted to start talking today is. One of the things that we pride ourselves on is we we're trying to change the way the world thinks about accounting. Yep. Um, that's a very, A, it's a great tagline because I think it it very firmly encapsulates all the things that we're doing, mm-hmm. but it's vague intentionally because we want it to be expansive. What I'm curious about is when you think about your journey over the last, I'm going to put you on blast, 25 years almost mm-hmm. of doing this type of stuff in accounting. Why is this something that is so important to you personally? Because I know it's important to you. Yeah, that's a great question. Why is it important to me? Mm-hmm. Um, for a lot of different ways. You know, when I when I when I first came into public accounting, well, actually back in college when I was actually studying to be in public accounting, I, I would my, my first love was finance, and so I thought, well, I want to be an econ major because finance is it. I'm going to go. I, I already got accepted the Kelly Business School, I, so I, I thought, well, this is going to be great. And then I realized that finance meant that I had to, if I wanted to be in the stock exchange, I had to be in New York, Chicago, something like that. And I thought, well, do I really want to be in a big city? I thought, probably not. That's the big city life is just not me. And so I thought, well, what can I, what else can I do? And I thought, well, accounting's great, you know, because if I, I can be in accounting and, and you know what, if it doesn't work out, I could do other things, you know, there's a lot of things I can do with accounting. So I thought, well, let's pursue this accounting degree. And in the back, you know, I thought hey, it, maybe it's a stepping stone to law because I thought law sounds kind of cool. I, I want to maybe be a lawyer. And so I got my accounting degree. And uh, during way back then, you could actually take the CPA exam while you're still in college. And, and so I st- took, took the Becker course as my uh, last semester of college. And then I uh, pat, you know, passed the CPA exam on the first try. It was like one attempt, and which at that time was like a 10% pass ratio. And I thought, wow, I, I wasn't really expecting to pass it like right away. And, and I thought, well, now what that means, I've got to actually work under a CPA for a certain period of time mm-hmm. before I can get my license. And if I don't do that, then kind of I just wasted all that studying and that accomplishment for nothing. And so I thought, let's put law school on hold. And so at the meantime, my wife went to law school. I went to pu- worked in public accounting and we, uh, we, we did that for probably about two years, two, no, about, real close to three years actually. And I realized that I hated public accounting. It was one of those things I just, it was, it was horrible. I, you know, I, I would get sick and, and December was like one of the worst months ever. Cause all I'm thinking about is, Oh geez, another busy season. Oh my yep. God, this is going to be horrible. And I actually got sick every January. Uh, so it was like strep throat January, you name it, because I just wore myself out getting diving in and, and you know, working, you know, 55 billable hours that you were required to have, uh, which meant you work in 60 or 70 hours easily. And um, because then everything was billable. And so, you know, it was like one of those things like I hated it. And so I thought, well, let me get out of public county. I actually got fired actually from public county. I don't know if I don't know if you guys knew that or not. Uh, I was working for um, a large firm and they the the owner called me and said, hey, Jody, um, love you, but uh, you'll never succeed in public accounting. Uh, Today's your last day. I'm like, wow, that was a harsh. You can see you now. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, wow, that was a harsh comment. And uh, and so I thought, well, I guess corporate world's for me. And so I. I went into the corporate world thinking, oh, this is my cup of tea. And I just spent all this time. I forego law school for this corporate world. Here we come. And that first year was awesome. Actually, I enjoyed the first year. I took over a, a um, an analyst position, which for a $250 million manufacturing company. And um, it was great. The experience was awesome. That first year, I took a 55 hour work week that the person before me had been working 55 hours for the last 30 years. I, I shrunk it to about 20 by automating everything I did, you know, hey, you know, putting everything in really cool spreadsheets, getting tools to do certain things. And then it was like, oh, no, now what do I do? I'm working 20 hours a week. And at that time, uh, the company was going through the first layoffs they've ever had. 
And I felt really bad because a lot of times I knew the person that was getting laid off. And so I'd be going out to lunch with them and they wouldn't know it and I would know it. And I was like, oh, this is super awkward. And um, I'm like, you know what? I'm only working 20 hours a week. Why don't I just bow out myself? And, and so I, I did. I went into the uh, CFO, which we were really good friends. And I said, you know what? I, I think it's time for me to move on. And I got this opportunity um, to run a small local CPA firm. Um, are you okay with that? And he said, well, the only way I'm okay with that is if you take us as your first client. Hmm. Wow. That's, that's pretty awesome. cool. Yeah. So it was like a $30,000 tax return at the time, you know, I, I and, and I've been doing the return for like the last three years internally. And he said, hey, let's continue doing it. Uh, we had Price Waterhouse Coopers reviewing it. And so it, it was really, it was really cool. It's like, wow, that was so grateful. And, and so I, I did that for a year. And uh, so I didn't like the corporate world uh, a lot of times because it was pretty much Groundhog Day. It was just kind of the same thing over and over and over again. And then I didn't like the public accounting world because, man, it just it, the hours were just un, un, unsubstantiated. I couldn't, you know, I, I just couldn't see myself doing that for thirty years. And then I, and then I went and thought, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this entrepreneur type of thing. We're actually running a firm. And again, we're talking a hundred thousand dollar firm, not not a big firm. Uh, and, and get started and really ramp it up, which which is what the goal is. And so once I once I moved over and did that, I grew that to a couple hundred thousand dollars. wasn't a much. Within one year, I hired Adam uh, right out of um, right out of school, right out of, right out of college. And um, within probably it was probably three months after I'd hired him, I got an ultimatum that hey, you know, from the from the owners above saying hey, you've got to fire Adam or and I and I'm like, well, I'm not going to fire Adam. I go, I'm already working. 80 hours a week. <laughs> and anyways, there's no way I'm going to fire Adam. And he said, well, then you've got a choice, either quit or fire Adam. And well, I took him up on their offer. I, I quit. Uh, the very next day, they were super shocked, super surprised. And I started Summit at that time. And so uh, when I started Summit, I, I, I started and I told my wife, I'm like, you know, April, I'm not the way I'm, way, I'm not going to do what I did with um, with BKD at the time. I'm not going to do what I did with Ray Magnet Wire, the manufacturing company. I'm surely not going to do what I just had with Frontier Financial, another the small local accounting firm. And, uh, you know, I'm going to do things completely different. And, and I'm going to, and I, I read a lot of books. And, and at that time in my life, I mean, reading books, I read a book a week easily. You know, I read probably 50 books in a year. And they're all self help books, uh, mostly business, you know, all, all business related books. And, and the funny thing is, you could ask me now, I probably couldn't tell you one author I read because I don't remember the authors. I couldn't even tell the titles of the books a lot of times, and, and, but I, 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 I soaked in the, the message and that was what was key. And uh, one book that really did stick out was E-Myth uh, by Michael Gerber. And that's the, I, I took that to heart. You know, hey, how can I how can I create my own new firm, bootstrapping it because I had no money. I uh, didn't grow up with money, had no money, uh, wasn't able to save a ton of money. I cashed my 401k, which it, which was like maybe twelve, fifteen thousand dollars not a lot of money. And that's how I started Summit. Thank God I had a bunch of credit cards because that's how I paid myself, which is kind of fun. I would never tell anybody to do that now, of course. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was fun. And, and I thought, you know, I'm going to change the way we do things. I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to create it, create a company that I don't have to have a busy season. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure that at that time, my employees only work four days a week. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, Make it so that they don't have to wear suits and ties and dresses and stuff like that, which was required in public accounting back then. Mm -hmm. And they can just dress normal. You know, I, I'm going to do a lot of things differently. And so when, when I did that, you know, my goal, my, the, the uh, you know, the, you know, our basically our, our theme was always, you know, changing. I'm going to change the way that people do things. And, and for, for most part, it was just me. I'm going to change the way that, you know, change the way that I do things because I, want to be part of my kids uh, when they grow up. I want to be a coach for my kids. I was a hockey coach when they were four years old, all the way through baseball coach, soccer, softball, basketball, every sport you can think of, dance. Unfortunately, I didn't do a dance. That would have been a bad, bad decision <laughs> on my part. Um, gymnastics would have been another bad decision. So we had other people do that. But we, we were involved with our kids, and I didn't want to be – that person that didn't know their dad or didn't know their mom, you know, that was, that's not, that wasn't, that's not, that wasn't me. And so I wanted to make sure that, Hey, whatever we, whatever we do create here, it's, it's not only conducive for what my lifestyle is going to be, but for all, my entire team. And, yeah. and that was key. Cause what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to, Hey, I got, I'm leaving at three 30. See you guys, you know, call me at eight o'clock and you guys get done. You know, I, you know, that wasn't me either. You know, so it was one of those things I wanted to make sure that I, I created a company that I could uh, that that could really be, take the benefits of public accounting, the benefits of the corporate world, and the benefits of family, and kind of combine them all together. And, and that's 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 why we created the summit, and and that's why the motto has always been uh, 
changing the way people think about accounting. And, and, and it's kind of funny because you mentioned changing the way the world thinks about accounting. That came up as a possibility. And Tom Barrett said, nope, too big of a goal. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we settled on people. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I like the world personally too. So I'm good with that too. No, yeah. I, I think if, if we're not trying to change the way the world's thinking, I, I get, I get taught. Yeah. And, you know, obviously I think the world, Tom Barrett, he's been a great coach to, to all of us. Mm -hmm. So yes, from a smart, like an attainable goal, yes, we're not going to change the world, but mm -hmm. we should still try to change the world, right? I 100% like, agree. I, I, yeah. I firmly believe it. And I, I stuck with my guns for the longest time until I said, well, we're not putting it on there. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it's no, kind of funny okay. though, to think about how many things you had done. And, and I know some of this is because we, you and I have personally had this conversation before, like yep. in intros mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yep. So many things that you were doing, even when you got started up until, you know, five, 10 years ago that were so like radical oh, yeah. that are just kind of now the norm. Mm -hmm. yeah. of what like I've heard from multiple people that consider you to be like a pioneer in this space yeah. in, in what we do like that, that is the adjective that they assign to you whenever they, whenever we talk to them about sure. what, what you did, you were ahead of the curve on, mm -hmm. on so much of what we're now starting to see people and firms and businesses, like all of that start to adopt and do. Yeah, it's kind of funny you mentioned that, and, and I do appreciate that. Thanks for the comments because I, I take that as a, a definitely a compliment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when the way that I've always looked at things is, people have always told me no with certain things, and and so no is to me is just the it's, it's just a roadblock, right? It's it's a hurdle that okay, so how can we turn no into a yes? And, and that and that goes with really anything. So someone says, hey, uh, we can't run that marketing campaign because of what? Well, okay, let's figure out how we can mar how, how we can run it so we get this result. Or, hey, you know, we, we can't, you know, build people by the hour, you know, or we, we, we can't build people flat fee. That was people told me that from the very beginning. It's like, why not? Let, let's do it. Let's figure it out. You know, and, and here are the benefits you know, for it. Or a hey, subscription based billing. No one's going to ever allow you to take money out of their bank account. I was told that 20 years ago because it wasn't common. Nobody did that. Right. That wasn't a normal thing. It was a normal thing for any company at that time. You wrote checks, you know, I, and I don't know if you know what a check is, but it's one of those things that it's, it's like that long and you write you know, stuff in it. But yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> but the people, that's what people did. Everybody had a checkbook. You wrote checks. And, and uh, you know, with that, it was like, well, why, why are we writing checks? Why not just zap their account? The, the fee's not going to change, you know, and, and, and people don't like writing checks anyway. So let's see how it works. And, and, uh, you know, Adam's like, oh, we're going to lose, we're going to lose all our clients. If we do it this way. And it's like, oh, no, we won't. Well, let's do it. And we did it and we didn't lose any clients. Actually, clients loved it. It was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Now I don't have to worry about, you know, paying you or getting behind accidentally or hopping on a call and have an awkward situation where we're talking about cash flow and, and, uh, you know, Hey, my mind's like, Hey, can you pay my bill? Even though you don't have any money in the bank, can you still pay my bill? <laughs> you know, cause it's due, you know, all, all that kind of stuff went away and it made, made life a lot easier. So, yeah. So you know, the, the, you know, the way I've always looked at things is there's no, there's no, there's only the only, only thing that you can't, you're never going to change. You're going to die at some time, you know, outside of that, you know, everything has, everything's up for grabs. So how you can, you know, how you can, you know, change it or, or mold it to some, you know, to a position or a way that you, you think is uh, more appropriate. Mm -hmm. That's always the thing that makes me laugh the most. And, and it's, you know, I, obviously I have friends and family who are still in accounting firms and we talk about what we do. Mm -hmm. And I hear all the time, well, that'll never work for us. I'm like, yeah, it will. <laughs> you know, we talk about, Hannah and I were talking about this earlier. Like, you know, I think Hannah and I have in the two plus years that we've known each other, we've met in person like a grand total of three times. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. it's like, I mm -hmm. feel like I know, I feel like I've known Hannah for my entire life. Yeah. And it's the same with you. It's the same with Jamie. Nah, it's the same with Adam and all of our people. Yep. You know, we've done, and it's, it starts with that intentionality and the vision of like, well, here's the culture I want and culture becomes what you want it to be. And it becomes what you allow. And you're like, I am not going to allow someone to like, hi, we're going to create structure. We're going to create opportunities for people to communicate and grow and learn as a team. And because of that, we are so integrated as a group that it doesn't, I do not feel the difference between where, you know, physically between where we all are. It feels like we've been one big team in the same office the whole time, even though we're spread around the country. And I think that's, uh, to your point, you know, it's refusing to say that this is the way it has to be and having the courage and the vision to say, no, no, no we're going to figure out how to make this work. It might have a few roadblocks, 
but we can overcome those. And I think that's such a different mentality than other places that I've seen that are just so stuck in the way they think about it. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And, and unfortunately, accounting firms are that way because accounting accountants don't like risk and they don't like change. And so risk and change together is really tough for a lot of people. And, and it really is even for our firm, really. I mean, because we're all accountants by nature, too. And so when risk and, and, and change happen, you know, people have to like, OK, and they have to kind of settle in, kind of think about it, find out the why behind it and mm-hmm. all of that kind of stuff before they'll accept it and, and go with it. Yeah. Uh, and the nice thing about what we've done over the years, we've hired people that we know that can accept change. We know that can take risks. You know, we, we, we hired what we call the non-traditional accountant. And uh, whether you two believe it or not, you guys are, are truly the non-traditional accountant. You know, somebody that can and work with risk and change. And, and that's uh, that's really, really key to our success. You know, you, you can imagine the thoughts when we decided to go virtual. You know, there was there was you know, there was maybe 25 to 30 companies that we knew of at the time in the world that was fully remote. And, um, you know, we met with them in a conference that was a call to fully, it was, it's called Yonder. It was, they, they brought about 15 of those companies together, um, you know, and it was all from a kickball company to digital marketing company to, you know, all different kinds of companies. And they were fairly, I'd say they were, they were, they were anywhere from probably on the small end, 15 people, you know, and on the high end, maybe 400 to a thousand people, somewhere in there. So a, a wide range, nothing, nothing gigantic. And when we decide, you know, to pull the plug and say, hey, we're going to get rid of the office, you know, the uh, I thought, first of all, I thought, oh, everybody's going to love this idea. You know, we're going to get rid of the office. And so we, we used to have what we call stand up meetings. I don't know if I told you guys the story or not. We had stand up meetings in which, you know, so and that's where you push the chairs together. Everybody stands up. Mm-hmm. You go through everything. And the idea is that we get get it done quickly. We don't like kind of rest and, and relax and let the meeting drag on forever. And uh, we always start off our meetings with a joke. You know, it was usually I told the joke. You know, that's kind of how it usually went. And, and then we kind of did a fun fact, you know, type of thing, which, which we still do today. Oh, so that sounds familiar. Yeah. yeah, sounds super familiar, right? And, uh, you know, with the joke, you know, I thought, you know, hey, I, and, and, I, and I, it, was, it, it was building up on me. I'm like, oh, I'm going to talk about, you know, going remote and doing all this stuff. I didn't even think about the joke. I forgot about it. And I went in and started talking about, hey, guys, I, we're going to go ahead and everybody, we're going to go remote. And, and uh and it was like everybody just kind of waiting for the punchline to to come. And it was like, no, no, seriously, we're, we're going to go remote. And and uh, Deb, which is our IT person, said, oh, that's a great idea. And uh, she's like, you know, I, I love it. And then Adam's like, I can't do that. I got kids. Um, no way I can do that. Um, you should have talked to me beforehand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, you know, and it was like one by one, everybody's like, no, nope, can't do it. Deb was the only person out of the 18 people in this room that said, yeah, I, I can go remote. So I thought, wow, that's weird. I go, I go, why can't we do it? Our, our clients are remote. We're working with them remotely. Why can't we be remotely? You know, what's, what's the difference? And it's like, no, we can't collaborate. We can't do this. All the stuff we heard before COVID, you know, that, you know, happened. And, and so it was like, okay, well, I, I didn't want to lose the firm. You know, it was like, it wasn't, you know, it, it was one of those risks. I wasn't really worth taking that I was going to lose all my people. And, and so I thought, well, I'm going to, spend some money and we're going to build out the office, the building I owned at the time. I thought, but it wasn't, it was only big enough really for 20 people. And, and I thought, Hey, well, someday 10 years from now, we'll get to about 30. So I wanted to build it for like 30 people. And mm-hmm. uh, so I, we, we gutted the office. We, we took out, we, we made some really cool conference rooms. We had, we had TVs and all the different rooms and the cubicles were giant. If you remember cubicles, they're really big. And uh, it was, it was really nice. And it took us, it took well. First of all, I thought it was going to take four weeks. That's why I was originally told it took over six weeks. It's probably closer to eight weeks. Um, we completely gutted the office, and so everybody had, we kicked everybody out of the office. And within that uh, eight week period, Adam built a uh, office for himself in his home. Um, Deb loved it, of course. Everybody's like all the reasons why people were giving me that it wouldn't work. They figured it out, and one by one, miraculously, everybody but three people said, "I kind of like this remote thing. Do you mind if we try it out?" I'm like, gosh, dang, you just spent a hundred grand. Yeah, so you couldn't have said that before I cut the check. <laughs> exactly. Spent a hundred grand. And uh and we never actually put the sign on the on the uh on the back of the of the office. You know, we we're gonna have this really nice sign right behind the reception desk. We never even got the sign up. And, and I thought, you know what, hold on that. We're not gonna spend another dime until we figure this out. And so, you know, one by one, and, and so then the, the idea was that, well, I'm gonna treat everybody as if they're remote working remote. So even the the three people or four people that still hung by they had no office hours with me at all. Mm-hmm. They had to work with me through Sococo, which is a, the software platform we're using. Mm-hmm. And uh, it worked out really well. Eventually, the people in the office said, well, you know, 
I might as well just work remote. <laughs> and then one by one, they actually ended up working remote too. And, and so then at that time, it was like, okay, so I held on to the building for probably another probably another year before I actually had uh, had leased it out. And uh, the bad thing about it was they tore every office out again. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> they changed it completely. The offices that never got used. <laughs> it's literally. A hundred thousand dollars. All the TVs I'm trying to give to people. <laughs> I was like, you get a TV, and you the get TV a TV that never got used. Yeah, it's like you get one. Yeah, I was even the construction guy. Hey, you want a TV? <laughs> Are there any still in storage? I, I I might know a guy. You know, yes. you know, you, you know how to find me. You're still still trying to get rid of those. What's yeah, interesting though about both of your stories that you told us so far is in both cases you had people. Adam Hale I saying, telling I you that, that, you against it. <laughs> that you couldn't do it. And so I'm thinking like, what if you have let that be the dominating voice in the story and yeah. what, like it would be, we wouldn't be here right now. Or if we had, it would probably look a lot mm -hmm. different. So like, yeah. how did you overcome that? Just that uh, opposition in both of those cases? Yeah, and, and I wouldn't. I don't know if it's necessarily opposition. I mean, because I, I don't look at what Adam Adam tells me or what anybody else says really as opposition. I, I look at it and as maybe that's part of it is not looking yeah. at it that way. Yeah, I don't. I don't get offended by it or anything like that. And I always listen. So, you know, a lot of people say that I don't listen. You know, like, hey, you're bullheaded. You don't listen. You're going to do it your way. It's like, no, that's not 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 the truth. I mean, just because I listen doesn't mean I'm going to act. And, and that there's a huge difference between that, you know, listening and I'm, I'm evaluating Hannah, what you're saying, Joey, what you're saying, you know, I might not agree with either one of you. I like mine better. So let's, let's go with mine. Or I, it might come down to, yeah, Joey, you got a great point. Never thought about that. Let's move towards the way you're doing it. And, and so that's that for a lot of people is listening oh, because, because now I'm agreeing with the way your position, that's not listening in my part. My point is my point is listening and deciding which I feel is the better opportunity to take and what's worth the risk. I, it's kind of funny. I just kind of naturally just kind of do it all in my head. And then I, we go the direction that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that I feel is necessary. And so, yeah, you're right. You know, I, I, I don't look at people that criticize. I mean, heck, if, if that was the case, my father-in-law would have been, you know, he was like, you know what, you need to work from nine to you know, eight to eight or seven to three 30 in this construction job. And it's a sure income. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's like, ah, oh, I'd rather control that, my opportunity than have it, have it controlled by me. And, and, and that's kind of the entrepreneur spirit that I have, but it's also the entrepreneur spirit I tried to put into the business, which I don't know if you guys realize it, but when you, when you think about it, look, you know, especially as CFO, looking at the compensation plan that we have, we have a base compensation and a variable comp in reality, what is that? It's kind of a commission structure, isn't it? You're, you're getting paid based on what you're doing now you're not hunting for that work you know you, you you're actually performing for that work and so it's it's kind of a commission structure which gives you kind of the entrepreneur spirit too and what i mean by that is you always have the ability to say no and so our cfos they get to a certain book of business and they've covered what we require their minimum book they can say no and not take on another client and guess what that's cool um that's where that's what they decided theirs was but you know they may want to say you know what i want to i want to make more money or i'm bored i need more more variety give me two more clients that's great too. And guess what? You're going to get compensated accordingly. And, and then again, that's the entrepreneur. That's what an entrepreneur does. I mean, that's an entrepreneur and that, and that's what, uh, that's the type of people we really enjoy working with and people that thrive within this is they have a little entrepreneur spirit into them, not a ton where they want to go out and just leave. I hope, you know, if they do great, you know, but we want that person that wants, that likes, a, likes a little safety net, but also wants the ability to kind of flex their, their muscles a little bit and, and rise to whatever, ability they want and and, and, we, and we let them make that decision which is the kind of the cool part about it and uh i don't know where i, I don't know where we came came about with that but that's you know that that's always been you know something that i've always tried to put into the company in some cases now it didn't happen in the earlier stages often is because we weren't as profitable we couldn't figure it out but once we figured out how to be profitable which did take a while because Again, we were the only ones doing it, so we didn't have anybody to guideline us or help us out. Or yeah, no, you had know, no KPIs for what what's good or not. You're just comparing yourself to yourself. Yeah, exactly. And for the longest time, we were it, <laughs> and uh, we were it that we knew of. Now there might have been other companies out there doing the same thing. We just didn't know who they were or knew knew of them. But for the longest time, we were we were it, and uh, you know, it, it's it was a lot of fun going it, and I wanted to share that with other people. Um, you know, in, in that regard. But the same point, you know, you know, Hannah, if you're not an entrepreneur spirit. You're an Ali Duras who says, you know, hey, I want safety. Safety is more important to me. That's fine too. You can go up to that level. Here's what you're going to make and here's what you're going to do. There's no upward or out type motion. And we, we provide that for 
for our team too. And so that was, it was both to recognize both of them and, and, and move towards the direction that, uh, you know, allow you to move towards the direction that you wanted to. I see so many, when you, when you think about that, the compensation model and the thought with the CFOs, when you mentioned that you were at your, your manufacturing job where you were the, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the controller role or whatever your role yep. was, the yep. analyst role. Yep. Moving that from 55 to 20 hours a week, that's exactly what we're encouraging our CFOs to do. Because if you had that same structure that we did, you could have said, hey, I've got this thing on lock. I'm ready for another client. I've systematized. I can now do this and benefit. And I can do the same thing again with this book of business. So I see so many shadows of your experience in terms of how we build things out. And I'm also yeah. really glad you mentioned, you know, Ali in particular, because I, I really enjoy working with Ali as a person um, and as as someone who relies on her work. That's an incredibly important person mm -hmm. in your business. I've, I've, I talk about this with, C, with other CPA yep. firms all the time. Where I'm yep. like, look, the person who's just a super rock star at their job, mm -hmm. who's like happy there, you're keeping them happy, everything, you know, benefits and compensation are what they need it to be. Yep. Everything's good that's the most valuable person in your organization. That is a fulcrum upon which you're going to grow a lot as a person mm -hmm. in an organization. And too many places say, oh, well, you don't have the ambition to move up. Mm -hmm. And I hate that. It, it makes me so sad because I'm like, no, you're completely missing the point. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. about that. Yeah, it's not. And, and, you're, and you're referring a lot to Radical Candor with Kim Scott. And, and she talks a lot about the rock star, the superstar, the no star. Uh, the no star, you got to get off the bus. You know, you mm -hmm. can't have the no stars on there. But the, but the superstars are the ones like the, you know, like the Hannahs of the world that want to go as far as they can go. You know, they want to they want to they wanna be a partner someday. They can't they can taste it so bad that they're going to do whatever it takes to get to that position. And right. then you got the, you got the you got the rock stars that are like the alleys of the world that, you know what, they're content with what they're doing. They like what they're doing. They don't want, they don't thrive for that promotion. You know, that that's not a big deal to them. You know, their deal is to do things really quality and get things done and, 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 and be the best of what they can be, you know, within that role. And, and both are equally important. You've got to have both. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's super important. A lot of companies want just, you know, they think the ambition person is the one that they want to build their co company with. Uh, the problem with the ambition person is, is that, most of them will get to a point and then they'll move on because they're looking for the bigger and better thing. You know, they, they got to their, they got to their peak or they got to what they thought was the peak or they're not getting there fast enough. So they want to go to the next shiny object company that, you know, tells them they're going to get there faster. You know, it, it, with, with the rock star, they typically aren't going to do that. And so you need, you need both. You need a solid foundation of rock stars and you need a solid foundation of, of the handles of the world to make sure that, you know, everything, you know, revolves around, you know, it, it really, revolves, it, that's how you become successful as a company, having both on the team and recognizing who that was. Don't push a, a Hannah, don't keep a Hannah down, you know, don't keep a Hannah down and say, hey, you're the best here. I don't want to move you on because I don't want to lose that position. You know, don't keep, don't, don't try to promote an alley up just because she's been working here for, you know, nine years doesn't mean that she wants to be, take that next step. She doesn't. Now you always have to go back and ask and look and make sure. And constantly reevaluate the priorities haven't changed. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. they could change. But for the most mm -hmm. part, um, you, you, you want to make sure people are in the right lanes. So we had a conversation earlier today with, like Joey said, with the student. And one of the questions that he asked us was, speaking to students, young professionals, people starting out early in their career, if they were to come and apply to uh, us summit mm -hmm. yeah. um what would you look at just from a resume perspective that you would consider to be I extremely valuable is that industry experience is it prior prior public experience what helps you identify that somebody might be um a rock star or a superstar or in good fit for the company overall as a whole yeah that, that's pretty tough because i'm super optimistic so i look at everybody and think oh everybody's going to be can, can actually do this uh well not not everybody can um I would say the, 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 you know, being in sports has taught me a lot of things. I, I, I love it when people have uh, sports or music or something outside of just school on their, on their resume. Um, Cause you know, sports, music, being part of a band, a group, you know, that that's, there, there's a lot that says to that cause you're accountable to people that you've got goals, you've got work ethic cause you're, you're, you're doing out something outside of you know, just school. So that's always been something that I've always looked at as, you know, Hey, that person's on the golf team let's take a closer look at that person versus somebody who just has a 4.0 GPA type of thing. So that that's important. Um, it, it's nice to have somebody that has some experience working remotely uh, because we do work remote. And uh, with that, 
uh, it's not for everyone. You know, some people need to have that day to day conversation, uh, day to day, you know, uh, you know, touching, feeling, you know, being with people type of thing. Uh, I'm one of those people, actually. I, I'm, a, I'm a complete extrovert. I love being around people. Uh, what, but I get a lot of sense. I get the same feeling, or even more so being on video with people throughout the entire day. I feel like I'm with people more often than I'm not. I you don't know, feel like so, I miss that at all. Yeah. It, interactions and I, I don't either at all. And, and I, I am a true extrovert when it comes to that. And so if I'm not missing people, missing things, I can't, I, I don't know how, why people wouldn't be unless they're not engaged. And that's the, that's the other thing. So like when we have our camp, like we always have our cameras on, we're remote, we're remote. We believe in cameras on all the time when you're remote. We don't believe on half a day, cameras off, cameras off when you don't want to have cameras off. No, it's cameras on, be present, be there. No different than you would be at work. You know, if you've got, I don't have my makeup on or whatever. Well, you would have your makeup on if you're in an office, make sure that you come prepared uh, to be there. I actually have I, I, I change my clothes when I get done. It's kind of funny. You probably didn't know that either. I, I change my clothes. I get out of my work clothes, you know, and I, I put my normal clothes on when I, uh, after the, after the day's done. So you, wait, know, you I, go from your work Hawaiian shirt to your play Hawaiian shirt. Yeah. Uh, usually, usually you catch me. I'm going to be like in a bar shirt with a cool like thing on the back. And you know, that, that, that that's normally what I'd wear in a, you know, when I'm, when I'm relaxing, but, but th those things are, are, are really important that, you, you, you can present those things and it's hard to do it in a resume. Obviously you definitely need to do it on, on a, in an interview, um, but making sure you have great presence on a camera, making sure that you're looking at people, making sure that your background's great. You know, if you're going to be virtual, you know, you shouldn't be down here where you, no one can see you or, or where you're, you're off to the side or whatever. You should be presentable. Make sure that what's behind you is presentable. You don't want a laundry piled all over everything because that tells people a lot about you, you know, from what's behind you, how, how you're presenting. And so it's important uh, that you do that as a remote person. It's also important to have some place that you can close and, and, and forget about work. You know, we always said it was, you know, like Apple had a, had a, um, um, a long time they had, if you work remote from Apple for a long time, you had to actually have an office inside your home. You know, that or a we call it a door. And I, I, I thought that idea was awesome. You, know, you have to have a door to be able to close and, and and then, you know, then your day's done. You know, you never open that door until the next day. Um, you know, with me, I don't have a, a door. I mean, I'm working here on my kitchen table. Um, you got my, bat, my my kitchen's in the back there. But guess what? When I'm done, my laptop closes. It gets turned off, put into a drawer and doesn't get opened up until the next day. You know, often it's too easy for people remote to be workaholics because it's like, well, I don't have anything else to do. I might as well go back to work. And then what they do is they find they're working 90 hours a week and, and it's, that's just unsustainable and, and not healthy. And so, you know, it, it's important as somebody interviewing for a job to understand, you know, Hey, is this something that I really want to try? I, I think I love working remote. I don't want to do the commute back and forth. I live in Denver or whatever that might be. And, uh, you know, I want to, I want to get the most out of it, how I can. And, and if, if you're thinking that working remote, it's also, oh, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want probably not the right thing. You know, you, 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 you're you working remote. It's no different than being in an office. You're there from eight to five. The, the, the biggest benefit from working remote in an eight to five situation or nine or seven to four, whatever you want to pick your hours is that you need to be there for one. But for two, if, if something comes up, like, you know, I had kids in you know, all different kinds of sports. If I had to hop out at three 30 to do something, you know, I'm back in my, at my desk at five o'clock and I'm working until seven 30. You know, I have that flexibility where I can kind of juggle things, juggle emergencies where I don't have as much of that flexibility, you know, in, in an office space, which is nice. If I had to cut out a half a day because I've worked a lot, I, I, I have that flexibility, you know, there's, you know, cause working remote, it's, it's not hours work. So you, you're not now, Hey, I'm on a clock for four, eight hours. I got to make sure I get those in. Uh, although that's important that the more, the more important thing is I got to get jobs done. I'm task oriented. So I got a deadline. I've got to get this to Joey, you know, a day before, so he can get a chance to review it before he goes and speaks to the client. Uh, and Joey's going to, Joey's looking at me at that. He's not looking at how many hours it took me to do it. He's looking at, Hey, did you get it to me? When I asked you, is it quality work? If it's, if it is, if it's both boy, Joey's like check mark, nice job. And, and, and going forward, if it gets to him that right up, right, right up before the meeting time, because you had other priorities or whatever, and you're missing something. Uh, yeah, you could have worked 80 hours a week and Joey to be like, uh, check mark being bad, you know, big X, you know? And, and so the, the type of work that you're doing is, is completely different as well. So it's, it's not just the, the, the remote work environment, but it's actually the type of task it's, it's task driven versus 
hours driven is the key there. You know, if, if, if Hannah was able to manage a million dollar book of business and work 35 hours a week, high five. I'm not going to ask her to work five more. No, no joke. I think my <laughs> highest book of business as a senior was like 900 and some odd thousand dollars. And like, there were a few weeks I worked more than 40 hours, but for the most part, like I had most everything delegated. Like, so, you know, I was just the reviewer and a lot of things. So that's how I was able to manage it. And yeah. I think, yeah, for so long, I thought, um, especially early on in my career, that it was either a career or being a great mom. It, it, it could not be both for for myself. And so that is one of the reasons that led me to leave the accounting industry. If you've listened to our podcast, you know that story for me. But then I found Summit. And one of the first questions that I asked uh, Josh in my interview was, I really wanted to be a, where I could go get my kids from school every day. That was really important to me. I was like, will I, will I be able to do that? Like, is it super strict on the hours? He's like, Absolutely. Like, please do. We have people who block that off on their calendar every single day. Absolutely do it. It is not based on like you super rigid schedule. And so like, it, you're not just talking the talk, like we're walking the walk over here too, because you'll see if you look at my calendar on any given day, I have it blocked on my calendar where I, I go pick up my kids almost every single day. And I'm able, kind of like you said, I'm able to coach my daughter's volleyball team this year. I'm able to, my son's about to start junior high sports. I'm able to, you know, block it off and go to his games. And I thought for so long that this was a needle in a haystack. I knew that this was what I was looking for when I found Summit, but I was like, it's probably a pipe dream. Like I'm probably <laughs> never going to find it. And then I didn't, I'm like shouting it from the rooftops now that like this exists, like you can come here and like love your career, but also still like be present for your family too. It's, mm -hmm. it's possible. Yeah. For the, for the longest time, kind of a, a, a side note, we had, I think we were like 20 people and my wife's like, Hey, do I have an issue here? And I'm like, an issue. What do you mean? And I, I go, well, why do you have 18 women working with you? And just, <laughs> <Adam>. <laughs> like, huh, <laughs> I guess I never even noticed. <laughs> so, it's like, okay. So we start hiring guys. <laughs> so, like, so that's, that's the Jamie not hire makes so much more sense now. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought he was a woman. Just he so still has know. the good hair. Like. The, baby thing, the hair back there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to provide, Hannah, I, li I like your story that I want to give a little testimony to that as well. Just looking at my personal journey, um, like when I joined the, the, the summit team before the merger, and I think it was about a month before the merger, I went to the doctor and got some blood work done just as a normal part of the thing. But like, I got all of my statistics. Uh, you can't tell from the background. Apparently I, I'm, I'm taller in real life than I look on screen, but it's I'm true. about six well, foot yeah, two. Yep. <laughs> um, and at the time I weighed 235 pounds in the two years since then, my blood work has improved on every single thing. I'm down to 205 pounds and I run between five to 10 miles a week with my wife. We have exercise. We're going here in a couple hours to go do a run. We're running a 10 K this weekend. And the ability with this job, with this flexibility, and, and it doesn't just work for extroverts too. I am 100% an introvert. I am not an extrovert. Uh, Jody knows this because Jody's going to shut down the bar. I'm usually leaving because I'm tired and need to go to bed and just recharge. But the ability to do this and take control and find the sim, you know, the, the, it's not about work life balance, in my opinion, it's about work life integration and finding the symbiosis that works really well for you. It's, it's, it's night and day for me and it's reinvigorated my account. I was ready to quit accounting mm -hmm. two years right. ago. Yeah. And I can't see myself doing anything else for the rest of my career. And that mm -hmm. is a testament Jody to what, your vision was and your intentionality behind that vision to have this be something different and remarkable. And I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'll, I'll be the first to say, we still got some things that we're trying to fix and change. And that's part of it. That's, that's part of continuous growth and continuous learning. And I want to come back to that, mm -hmm. but I did want to just say, thank you for what you've done for me personally, for everyone here at the company in terms of, of allowing this for us because this has become the gold standard in my mind for what this could and should be. No, I agree. And I appreciate that. Uh, you both, uh, super great compliments. And I, I guess I, I appreciate it a ton. Um, 
yeah, as, as an entrepreneur, I, I had that flexibility. I had that opportunity and I had that dream and goal kind of circling back to the, the way we wanted to change the way that people think about accounting, because mm -hmm. there's, there's three meanings to that. You know, the, the one meaning is that we want to change the way customers think about it, right? You know, how, our, how our clients look at things, Hey, how we're not always looking in the past, we're looking at things and now we're trying to teach them, coach them, model things so that they can look forward in the future. You know, it's kind of funny. You get the clients to say, oh, I don't I have no idea what's happening in the, in the future. It's like, well, you, you can kind of predict it. And, and there's, there's ways of doing that and we can show you how to do that. And, and so that was the, that was the one thing, right? Uh, the other thing was, is changing the way the industry looked at it, right? That was the bigger global thing. You know, Hey, you know, we want to, we want to be the, 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 the beacon for change within the industry. We want to be that firm that everybody's referring to. How does Summit do it? How, you know, I might not do everything the way Summit does it, which is fine, but you know, Hey, how, how did they do it? What, what did they do? And we've opened our playbook completely to the accounting industry. You know, we, we were at all these different conferences and, and teaching them how we do it, what we failed at, what we succeeded at, you know, what worked, what didn't work, you know, what, what works better, you know, and, and also and the, the nice thing about that, it gives the accounting industry, you know, you know, Hey, some, some ideas on how to improve the entire industry themselves, how to bring the entire industry up, which has always been a goal. But, but the other thing was that employees, you know, changing the way that employees think about, you know, this, you know, with, with me being the, the starting, I, I didn't want, I didn't want to do what I was doing at Crow and BKD. I didn't want to do that. Price Waterhouse offered me an opportunity right out of, right when I was working at Ray, I'm like, I don't know if I want to get back into that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, cause there's a lot of great things that that has. And for some people that's perfect a perfect scenario for, for me, it really wasn't, it wasn't a good fit for me. And I'm not saying it's not a good fit for everybody because public accounting is a great fit for a lot of people, but just not me. Uh, corporate world I thought was the great fit too. And I realized not a great fit for me either, you know? And, and so it's like, how can I make combine these two? And like I said earlier, you know, combining it and creating this um, idea of summit and then be able to grow it to where we've grown from nothing when we first started. Uh, we had that $30,000 client, you know, that Ray Magna Wire allowed us to continue on as their tax person for a few years, even after Summit. Um, you know, and that was the foundation that I was able to pay Adam and get things started and all that kind of stuff and, and grow it to where we eventually, you know, got to a little over $10 million in revenue um, at, at, a, at a, a speed of with a growth rate of doubling our size every three years a bottom line profit margin of about 20, 25% growing really well, merging into Anders, a much bigger firm and uh, continuing on what we're our legacy and what we're doing with Anders and really helping them grow a service line that they, that they had initially, but adding to it and, and really kind of expanding on it with, you know, ultimate goal of eventually getting to a $50 million service line with inside of Anders is the ultimate goal. Now that's going to take us probably, you know, five years, six years, seven years, whatever it might do, or maybe it's quicker, who knows, but that has that ultimate dream or ultimate goal. Of, hey, getting something bigger, it, even making it more so, you know, changing the way that people think about accounting, you know, how many times can you buy another, another arm or another service line to have it grow at a really high pace and speed, keep it intact and bring a ton of value to the company. And so, you know, th those are all the, the dreams and goals and the stuff that have circled around and it's all because I was just kind of a misfit when it came to accounting. And, uh, you know, if I had went into finance, I'd probably be on the stock market somewhere or a stock exchange somewhere and, and, uh, dealing and trading and all that kind of stuff. I'm glad I didn't go that route. I'm glad I went to this route cause it's uh, much more fulfilling. Um, wasn't all, it wasn't all roses going through, believe me, it was struggle after struggle after struggle. You know, every year was the next year I was going to do it. My wife was getting tired of hearing, I hear you're going to do it next year. I'm like, yeah, this is going to happen. All these great things are going to happen next year. And then all these things I didn't know about hit me and I had to make changes and stuff like that. And so then it was the next year. Adam was tired of it too. If you ask him, he was tired of hearing next year also <laughs> until next year actually truly came. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, and then, it, and then it uh, just excelled tremendously and it allowed us to hire people uh, like the two of you, you know, we would never be able to hire you when we started. We couldn't afford you. You know, there, there's no way it, that it, it just couldn't have, wouldn't have happened, couldn't have happened and, and didn't happen uh, to where now we can, we can hire the best and the brightest and uh, we can have the best and brightest working alongside us and hopefully someday taking my position over and, 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 and moving forward and leading the company, which is the, the ultimate goal, I think, of an entrepreneur and definitely the ultimate goal of, of mine. 
Well, I'm so glad you said that. And it's, you know, that was along the lines of what, you know, we hear all about, about it all the time, right? And I tell people we're looking for the best, the brightest, throw all the ideas in the middle, the best idea wins. And, you know, I think we're very, very well positioned, not only to grow, but to find some really good people to, to grow along with. And, you know, we, we talk all the time about the, the wonderful hires that we're making. We've got a lot of really good, really good people that we're working with. Yeah. Where, where I really want to kind of end this conversation, Jody, is I want to kind of step back for a second and, and kind of put our galaxy brains on. Like we've done a little bit of a journey here over the last 20 to 25 years where we started with, again, a $30,000 client moving to where we are now. Mm -hmm. Putting on your visionary cap for a second, what are some things that when you're, when you're reading the, the crystal ball about what the next five to 10 years are going to look like, where does your mind go about you know, what the next big, big change is. What's, I mean, obviously AI is something that we're thinking about a lot, but I'm curious, right. what's the next big shift that you're planning for? Kind of like how the world sort of just needed to become more remote and you were ahead of the curve there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the net, uh, AI is obviously going to play a huge part of this and mm -hmm. it's really accelerated it for me or my thoughts. Yeah, you know, I, I wrote an article, this is probably about 10 years ago, talking about how uh, accounting was actually, going to eventually go away, you know, it's going to be, uh, and, and, and what I mean by that is counting the way that we look at it now, mm -hmm. no, no different than when we used to do tax returns, man, we used to do them by hand and you'd have to have all these sheets and you'd make sure one said, you know, one sheet agreed to the next. And you'd, it was, it was a complicated issue where software takes care of it just like this. And you're now being the reviewer, making sure it looks mm -hmm. good. sounds good. Mm -hmm. It does what you want it to do. And, and accounting is going to be the same way, you know, eventually, you know, bill paying and counselors, you know, AR, all that kind of stuff will just simply be automated. And, and guess what? Advisory will be the biggest thing that, that uh, accountants really need to understand, really need to work with and really need to be really good at because mm -hmm. that's going to be what clients are going to want. You know, the accounting stuff's going to be done in the background by AI, by something else, you know, super simple. Uh, whereas the advisory component to it is going to be the key that that business owner is going to rely upon. To, to make those decisions. And that, and that's going to be, you know, that, I think that's coming sooner than what you think. And I, I mm -hmm. and I hope uh, firms out there positioning themselves to, to make that change or make that shift and not focusing on what worked in the past. Cause I don't think what worked in the past is going to be what's going to, what's going to work for accounting firms in the future. Mm -hmm. I think that speaks to something Joey and I have talked about a lot is the fact that you can read the books, you can go to school for accounting, you can be a CPA, like whatever the credential is, you can have that and probably be a decent advisor. But I would say the soft skills that mm -hmm. you need to have in this role today more than mm -hmm. ever are going to absolutely be essential for our industry within the next few years. And that's something that like you got to put in the work for yourself. Like you, mm -hmm. you just got to get the reps, you got to do it. You got to, you know, look at the trainings, like learn from other people, get mentorship, like whatever that is. But that I think even for me in my role now, I feel like that's half the battle sometimes is my relationship with the clients mm -hmm. and the connection that I can make with them. And just having the ability to walk in a room and talk to anybody like that is so incredibly valuable and will be even more going forward. Mm hmm. And I've got the perfect business case to support what you're saying. We have, a, 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 we're working on a, a particularly challenging client onboarding right now. And we were not doing things exactly the way we needed to do just because it, it was a challenging client. We had some things we needed to figure out. And, you know, the work that we did on the personal level, on the advisory side of the house, creating those relationships, creating that partnership with the client that's given us the buffer that we needed mm -hmm. to fix the back end stuff had we not done that we would have lost that client and with that all of the annuitized streams of revenue all of the the work that we've done so far like the the opportunity cost of the cfos and the the seniors the the brilliant minds that we put on that account mm -hmm. we would have lost that but we didn't because we invested in our team and our team then invested in their relationship and that's it's the number one thing I tell high school students all the time. Like, look, you, whatever it is you're going to do in life, whether you're an accountant, whether you're a historian, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a, you know, a, a plumber, it doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing you can learn right now is how to communicate, how to tell the story and how to 
create those relationships with your customers and your team. If you don't do that, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how good you are. You'll never, the world will never figure that out. Yeah. I think being curious is a, a component mm-hmm. there as well. You know, not yeah. just, not just doing it because it was done that way last year or someone did it in the past that way, or it's always been that way, you know, try something different, you know, be curious and find out why, you know, ask the, ask the question why many, yes, many times yes. to figure out what, why you're doing something versus just what you're doing. Um, a lot of times you'll find that, uh, a lot of people don't know why they're doing it to begin with, you know, and it's kind of funny, you know, the, the, the story you probably have heard of where the grandma was baking cakes and every year she would cut the corners off the cake. So it kind of looked like an octagon type looking cake and um, the, the, everybody loved it. And, you know, she cut it and, and did it. And so guess what? It got carried down to the next generation and the next generation did the same thing. They cut the corners of the cakes off and, and, and put it in there and, and grandma came over one day and it's like, why did you cut the corners of the cakes off? He's like, well, grandma, that's what you've been doing forever. He's like, well, yeah, because I couldn't fit it in my oven. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like you know, something as silly as that, <laughs> you, you know, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so asking the question why is super important. So you understand why you're doing something and not, not to challenge it. You're not challenging it. You're just simply being curious. You know, why is it done that way? You know, and, and then what you're doing is, well, is there a better way of doing it? And, and Joey mentioned this earlier, is that intuition that you get, you know, by just continually asking why and figuring out better ways of doing something, it, it, it's going to make your job a lot better, the company's job you're working for a lot better, and, and because you're innovating and that word gets used a lot, but that's truly what innovation is, is trying to figure out how we can better something by just simply being curious and asking why. Mm-hmm. Well, Jody, it sounds like, it sounds like it's time to wrap up the podcast. I know I've got a few things that are on my on my calendar left to do here, but thank you so much for for joining us. This has been a, a true pleasure, and um, I'm really excited to see where we go um, and where we're going next. And and I'm I hope that the the students and and folks who who want to work with us, who if if this is for you, we want to hear from you. So I'm I'm very excited to see. Where are we going? Is there a place, Jody, where we can we can connect with with you? Obviously, we know how to connect with you, but like our audience can connect with you or learn more about any of the the multitude of books that you have also written in addition to to reading. How can we find out more about you? Yeah, it's kind of funny. If you just Google me, it, it's weird how I'll pop up like all over the place. Uh, <laughs> Jody Grundin. Jody Grundin. <laughs> yeah, just Google Jody just Grundin. Flex there. It's, it's YouTube me. <laughs> YouTube me, Google me, or I pop on LinkedIn. I'm there as well. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, my email is obviously something you have access to. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jody at summitcpa.net. Uh, .net, because originally we couldn't afford .com, so we went .net. So uh, Jody at summitcpa.net. And uh yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to chat with you for a little while. If you want to schedule a time just to just to chat, I'd be happy to do that. Um, or correspond, you know, through uh, email or uh, on LinkedIn. Great. Cool. Thank, thank you so, so much, much for being here with us. We're excited to be along for the ride. Yeah, thank you. If you're a young CPA looking to develop in their careers, we're always looking for great people. Visit our website for remote work opportunities with Summit Virtual CFO or find all our open positions at Anders CPAs and Advisors.